Carteret of Saltrums, who as governor of the Isle of Jersey had sheltered the Duke. Sir William Covenant, advisor to the Duke, is also present for this historic day. This is a day when the eyes of Englishmen are looking toward a new continent across the sea, America. Before this day is over, James will give to Berkeley and Carteret all the land lying between Manhattan Island and the Delaware Bay and River to the south and west. Recalling Carteret's stout defense of the Isle of Jersey for King Charles, the Duke also this day decreed that this gift of land should be called New Jersey. Jersey. What was it? Who really knew? Surely no one in England knew what was to be found here, for few explorers had ever gazed at its white sands and rolling dunes. Two that had were Giovanni da Verrazzano in 1524 and Henry Hudson in 1609. Inland, virgin forests of pine stretched westward from the sea. rolling hills, mountains, and tall hardwood forests were dotted with sparkling lakes. Everywhere, rushing streams searched for outlets to the sea. For some, the search led to the Delaware River in the west. For others, flowing eastward, the destination was the mighty Hudson its wooded banks crowned by towering palisades. Within the woodlands dwelled the Indians, the Leni Lenape, whose name meant the original people. Friendly and peace-loving, they lived along the riverbanks. When this boy came of age, this thick hair would be pulled to leave a scalp lock in the center. For daily meals, the women cooked wild game or fish. They grew squash and beans. Corn was dried and ground into meal. Although the original people are gone, dioramas like this one in the State Museum at Trenton almost bring them back to life again and take us back to an earlier time in New Jersey history. A time when the settlers came, beginning with the Dutch to the north and the Swedes and Finns to the south. The early settlers traded textiles and trinkets, axes, knives and tools in exchange for furs, food and land. Land on which the Dutch built sturdy homes, like the Steuben House at River Edge, or Marl Pitt Hall in Middletown, both now preserved as historic museums. Land on which the Swedes and the Finns built America's first log cabins, such as this cedar plank house at Hancock's Bridge in Salem County. After 1664, the British proprietors divided the land into West New Jersey and East New Jersey. The office of the proprietors of East New Jersey still stands here in Perth Amboy. This office and the office of the proprietors of West New Jersey in Burlington are headquarters of the two oldest active corporations in the state. Preserved among the West New Jersey records 
is one of America's great documents of democracy. The concessions and agreements of the proprietors, freeholders and inhabitants of the province of West New Jersey in America. This relatively little known document provided for popular election of representatives by secret ballot. It guaranteed broad personal liberties, including complete freedom of conscience and religion, protection of the individual, and trial by jury. To East New Jersey came many settlers from New England. Their influence remains in the design of their houses, in the restfulness of shaded village greens, and in the lofty spires of colonial churches. West New Jersey, on the other hand, was settled by the Quakers. Many of their meeting houses and homes of red brick still stand. This historic Hancock House and others in Salem County are decorated in patterns of glazed brick. Here you'll find owner's initials and dates of construction covering nearly a century of New Jersey history. This was a century that had seen growth and changes in the new world. The two Jerseys were united in 1702 under a royal governor, and Jerseymen found themselves, literally, in the middle of things. Lying between two great cities, Philadelphia and New York, this narrow corridor became the colonial pathway for travel and news. Within this belt were built roads and towns. At Princetown, the College of New Jersey became noted. And in 1766, Queens College was founded at New Brunswick, giving little New Jersey two of only nine colleges in colonial America. Thriving inns at wayside corners served travelers of all opinions. <laughs> Over New Jersey roads ran the swiftest transportation of the time, carrying the mail, the latest news, and the discord now spreading through the colonies. Wherever travelers stopped, eager ears listened to the facts and the rumors of the day. News oft times disturbing. For the liberties of Jerseymen were beginning to be restricted by King George's insistence that there must be taxes. Taxes without representation ignited fiery protest. This monument in the Jersey town of Greenwich honors local citizens who protested the tax on tea in December 1774 Dressed as Indians, they seized a cargo of tea and set it afire. The flames of unrest spread. There were shots at Lexington. The Liberty Bell rang out, and Jerseymen joined colonial brothers in arms. New Jersey became revolution's crossroad. Here would be fought five major battles and scores of skirmishes. Driven from New York by well-armed British regulars and Hessians, General George Washington escaped across the Hudson with his men in November of 1776. Pursued by the Redcoats, Washington led his inexperienced volunteers across New Jersey all the way to the banks of the Delaware above Trenton. Here in early December, commandeering every available boat, the Americans escaped to the opposite shore, leaving their pursuers no means of following. With the British in possession of New Jersey and the bitter cold of winter coming on, Washington decided on the war's boldest stroke. He would attack. On Christmas night of 1776, strong seamen from New England rowed the heavily loaded boats across the ice-choked river.
horses, cannon, and 2,400 men are braving an icy and treacherous river. Men with no illusions, hungry and cold. Their retreat made them objects of ridicule. Now, following a dauntless and determined leader, fighting for the right to shape their own destinies, these men are crossing from despair and defeat to hope and victory. It was long past midnight before the crossing was completed. With wind-driven sleet lashing at their faces, the troops followed Washington nine miles southward to astound the Hessians at Trenton with a surprise attack. Famous paintings in the old barracks at Trenton and other New Jersey museums tell the story of the Trenton Triumph. Washington's army was often in New Jersey. At the Battle of Monmouth in June 1778, General Lee retreated in panic under British attack. But Washington arrived to rally the demoralized forces. The now experienced Americans proved at Monmouth their ability to fight the British regulars on an open battlefield. Before this scorching Sunday at Monmouth was over, a favorite American story would begin. The story of Molly Pitcher, who carried water to the soldiers, then took her husband's place in battle as he lay wounded beside his cannon. In the bitter winter of 1779-1780, Washington made his winter headquarters at the Ford Mansion in Morristown. This tiny room was the general's office. We know much about those Morristown days from Washington's own records, personal as well as official. He wrote that here, in the great kitchen of the mansion, 18 members of his staff and the Ford family were huddled, and in his own words, scarce one able to speak for their colds. Nearby in the deep woods of Jockey Hollow, soldiers barely survived the winter. Their rude huts are gone, but a reconstructed officer's hut provides visitors a good idea of the inadequate protection. This reconstructed log cabin hospital shows how Jockey Hollow's ailing men were sheltered. At long last, spring came to Morristown, and with it came Lafayette, as shown in this diorama in the Morristown National Historical Park. Greeted by Washington, Lafayette brings good news. The French Navy has sailed to help the American cause. News of final victory came in 1783 to the Continental Congress meeting in Nassau Hall at Princeton, then capital of the newborn nation. Later, at the Constitutional Convention, New Jersey fought for small states to be equally represented in Congress. The direct result was the United States Senate. When the Constitution was amended to add the Bill of Rights, it gave to all Americans many of the same rights provided by West New Jersey's concessions and agreements a century before. New Jersey joyfully ratified the Constitution, being the third state to put its great seal in place swords and guns would be wrought into plowshares. From the beginning, agriculture had been the way of life, and New Jersey quickly became known as a breadbasket of the new nation. For those who worked the land, days were long and full, but crops were good, and orchards heavy with fruit. Life on the farms was simple. Man was sufficient unto himself and to his brood. Inside the homes there was cooking, candle making, 
all the housekeeping skills that every young lady needed. Here in the Dye Mansion at Totowa, the colonial devs show how Johnny Cake was baked over an open fire and demonstrate many of the domestic arts, such as lace making. and spinning. In the towns, industry had begun. Skilled New Jersey potters turned their wheels. Blacksmiths met needs of builders and farmers alike. And in many small factories in the pine lands, southern New Jersey glass became famed throughout the nation. Memories of those days live on here at Clayton, where blowers using the methods of colonial times continue to make the old-time hand-blown glass. Almost every stream had its grist mill, and the miller's wheel was soon joined by others, for water could provide the needed energy for growing industry. This is the sound of power, the power of the Passaic River, plunging 70 feet downward in a show of strength. Beside these mighty falls, the city of Patterson was founded in 1791 as America's first planned industrial city, destined in a century and a half to make everything from textiles to locomotives to airplane engines. Growing industry needed iron, and iron was made in many locations such as Allaire in Monmouth County. Here the old beehive stack of the original furnace and the restored 19th century buildings are preserved in an unusual state park. Another state-owned memento of an iron heritage is the baronial mansion at Ringwood in Passaic County. At Batstow in the Pine Barrens of Burlington County is still another iron village preserved by the state. New Jersey was on the move but a growing land needed better transportation. In 1786, John Fitch, a Trenton gunsmith, sailed America's first steamboat between Burlington and Philadelphia. In the 1830s, two important barge canals were built. The Morris Canal climbed from Jersey City to Lake Hopatcong, 924 feet above sea level, then descended toward the coal fields of Pennsylvania. To the south, the Delaware and Raritan Canal connected Bordentown, Trenton, and New Brunswick. A mural in Wharton Town Hall shows how Morris Canal barges were lifted over the mountains by a system of locks and inclined planes. Today, at the canal's Lake Hopatcong Dam, children frolic in waters no longer needed to float the barges. The barges are gone, too, from the Delaware and Raritan Canal but the placid waters remain. The vital flow of commerce on those canals is but a memory, for waterways quickly gave way to railroads. John Stevens built America's first locomotive, which ran in Hoboken in 1825. After that first Stevens locomotive, New Jersey took a leading spot in the railroad race. Railroads built industrial cities, but they also brought change to the agricultural counties. Growth came to rural county seats such as Newton in the hills of Sussex, Belvedere in Warren on the Delaware, Flemington in Hunterdon's fertile fields, Mount Holly on the edge of Burlington's pine forests, May's Landing in the back country of Atlantic County, and to Cape May Courthouse in the south. In many of the courthouse towns, much of the atmosphere of the 19th century lingers. 
And here too can be learned much of New Jersey's role in the Civil War when 88,000 of her men and boys enrolled and 6,000 never returned. New Jersey was now two centuries old, but stood on the threshold of its most fabulous years. One Jerseyman, more than any other American, would lead that march into the future. Thomas A. Edison. His story lives on in the Edison National Monument in West Orange. Here is a model of his earlier laboratory at Menlo Park, where on October 22, 1879, his thousands of experiments finally produced the world's first practical incandescent lamp. Using a filament of carbonized thread, that lamp glowed for 40 hours. Then Edison stepped up the current to see how much it could take. Man could no longer live in darkness, and soon Edison generators were humming everywhere, producing light and power to revolutionize both industry and the home. Edison also gave mankind the means to hear itself sing. The museum has the original phonographs and the earliest recordings. Movies came, too, from the Wizard of Menlo Park. In the Black Mariah, a replica of the first movie studio, visitors can see an Edison film, the original Western, made in New Jersey. the guns blazed in the first westerns, a new and compelling sound was heard. America became a nation on wheels, and New Jersey factories turned out dozens of brands of cars, including the famous Mercer and the Simplex. The automobile swiftly rolled New Jersey into the 20th century, a century that has continued to accelerate to almost dizzying speed. Year by year, the old trails have been replaced by the amazing complex of parkways and interchanges that characterize New Jersey today. Symbols of America's fastest moving half century of history, now fly in a few minutes what once took days to travel. From Newark, founded in 1666 as a village of 30 families, to Camden, once a tiny ferry landing on the Delaware. Everywhere the sprawling giants of heavy industry mingle with the trim beauty of suburbia. Shipyards, harbors, power plants, and factories are attuned to a century which has known two world wars and an amazing population growth. The Golden Dome of the state capitol in downtown Trenton rises above the home of New Jersey's government. And nearby, this towering monument stands in memory of the Battle of Trenton in 1776, a symbol of freedom for which Jerseymen have always fought. Old Queens College in and the College of New Jersey has become Princeton University. These have been joined by more than 40 other universities and colleges. Edison is gone, but on this tower at Menlo Park, a giant electric light bulb glows at night, symbol of the billions of lights that burn today in industries, in cities, and in homes. Research pioneering continues in hundreds of New Jersey laboratories, revolutionizing the world of today and tomorrow, in industry, in medicine, 
and electronics, probing the newborn world of nuclear physics and chemistry, carrying research and communications into the vast unknown of outer space. The Leni Lenape are gone, but their colorful Indian names remain. Some of the deep woods the Indians knew are now state forests, protected for all to enjoy. The mountains and the lakes are playgrounds for all. shores where Indians gathered for summer fishing now blossom with the color of summer gaiety. And where they once set their wigwams, hotels tower against the sky. Famous resorts, Atlantic City, Asbury Park, and dozens more from Cape May to Sandy Hook. But for those who would see the shore almost as Henry Hudson saw it, there are miles of sanctuary where nature is preserved. And the ocean continues to roll. The same ocean that linked England and America three centuries ago. When James, Duke of York, with a stroke of the pen, gave all this part of the new world to his friends and with his gift, decreed that henceforth and forevermore, this should be the land called New Jersey.